Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Another episode of EOS. Yo, big shout out to everybody that's been subscribing and rocking with me. I really appreciate it. I checked like 20 minutes ago. We at what, like 5,000 subscribers? That's wild. Um, I got some stuff, you know, planned for the future for y'all. I got some wall art that's going to be, um, you know, going in the back, obviously. So you don't have to look at this blank wall. Um, I got some people that I've done time with personally like either been in a cell a dorm anything like that that i'm going to be bringing on here for interviews so they're going to be able to just speak on their experience the same way they're going to touch down on some of the uh experiences we had together tell y'all some crazy stories but yeah this episode here starting off where we left off on the last one um this is going to be pretty much all about confinement so when i got fired up the first thing that happened is everyone involved in that, those four people, we all went under investigation. When you go under investigation, you go into administrative confinement. When they come to a conclusion on what happened, um, you're either let out of investigation, you go back onto the main unit, or what will happen is you go to disciplinary confinement. And if you've been you know, disciplined, if you get 60 days, excuse me, 60 days, a hundred days, however many days you have to do, you would do that in disciplinary confinement. So what the CEOs did, um, and like I told you guys, they originally had beat the other two people that we were with. Um, I don't care if you're my enemy. I don't care if you just put a hole in my head. I don't want to see you get beat by a CEO. If anything's going to happen, I'd rather do it myself, but situations like that you know you can't really avoid them and i felt for him just like how i felt for my brother that got beat you know what i mean but basically what these ceos did is after they beat the other two inmates that didn't have anything wrong with them because me and the other zo we both had holes in our heads um they said that i did that to the zo and that the other kid did that to my brother so they basically lied and said that we did everything to each other you know they said that the kid hit me with a brick i hit him with a lock vice versa and the other story so we all went to confinement under investigation every one of us got sentenced to crazy crazy time in confinement now just to point this out in new york i'm not 110 percent sure of what the law is specifically but from what i've heard if you're under 21 they won't let you be in confinement for over 24 hours that it's been proven is psychologically damaging to your mind frame at that age you know what i mean i got sent to 290 days in confinement all in all if you want to count the investigation because the investigation doesn't count towards time your time starts once you get disciplinary time i've done over a year in prison so out of the three that i was in there i did over a year in confinement confinement it's unavoidable especially if you're in wars and you know getting into things like that that you're not supposed to get into so i got hit with i mean originally it was 60 days for assault on an inmate 60 days for the weapon it added up it wasn't originally 290 that i got sentenced to um, but because of the fact that I was also getting DIs in confinement, I ended up doing 290 days. Now, a lot of people think that when you go to confinement, you're safer. It couldn't be nothing further than the truth. It's, confinement is a whole nother league in itself. When you go to confinement, you're not in a room by yourself. You're going to have a bunkie and... They don't discriminate on race, on gangs, nothing. So my first bunkie in confinement at Lancaster was actually a zoo. And they used to put a ton of opposite gang members in the cells together so that when something happens on the main unit, when the orderly comes in and passes out trays, you know, they'll tell us who got hit up. And if one of our people got hit up, every single blood that had a zoo in the room would fight and vice versa. You know, if you had a king in the room with... A, a different gang and you know the king found out one of his people got hit him and that person in his room are gonna fight they're gonna tear it down and this is non-stop bro you might fight your roommates every single day multiple times a day you don't want to fall asleep because you don't know if he's gonna jump on top of you and start you know fighting inside of the cell 
you, you got to be careful with a lot of things. Sometimes they'll try to keep the food trays in the room so you can literally fight with the food tray. It's made out of hard plastic. Um, and then, you know, sometimes like at Sumter CI, we had pokers in confinement. So there was one point in time I had like a 14-inch piece of fence, you know, in the cell with me. Huge piece of fence. Um... And basically, if you get a roommate you don't like, you know what I mean? Or if you get a roommate and y'all get into it, you're going to do what you have to do inside of that cell. Now, there's multiple ways of getting weapons in confinement. Um, you know, I'm not going to name every single way, but there's multiple ways of getting weapons in confinement. So you might get cut in confinement by your cellmate. You might get poked up. Another thing that's dangerous is when they take you out for showers or anything, they cuff you up one by one. So I remember I seen this one kid, you know, I sumped the CI, the cells are across from each other, so you can see the cells across from you. And I seen this one kid when his, you know, bunkie cuffed up, he wasn't cuffed up, he grabbed a poker out of his mattress and started poking up his bunkie while the kid had his cuffs on. So he couldn't fight back, he's just, you know, getting hit up. The CO's are spraying gas, but the gas really, it doesn't do anything. It's not going to stop a fight, it's not going to, you just start coughing, you can't breathe. But... I mean, that kid got hit up a few times, you know what I mean? Um, they took him out on a stretcher and everything. So confinement can definitely be super, super dangerous, but that's just in the youth offenders. So I did a ton of confinement time at Lancaster, and pretty much all of us were shipped. They shipped, I don't even know how many of us there was, like maybe 30 of us, something like that, all at one time. So usually when there was big gang wars, they would just ship the gangs off. So, I mean, when we got shipped, the bus was mostly Zoes and then Bloods. When we got on the bus, everybody was pretty quiet, you know. And um, basically someone spoke up. I'm not sure who it was or what side they were from. But it became an understanding that what happened at Lancaster is going to stay at Lancaster. We're not just about to go to war on this bus. You know what I mean? We pretty much were only going to war under the terms of Lancaster. And the majority of us didn't even know why we were at war. We didn't even ask questions. We just went and we did what we did. A lot of us are still building a reputation. And you don't really care to ask these questions. Nobody really wants to be a mediator. We just want to get our name up like anyone else. So the bus ride, there was no issues. From Lancaster, we went back to Lake Butler. Um, because I was already in confinement, they put everybody in confinement still. So you're still serving your confinement time. Now, I was with my brother that got beat. And, you know, they broke his face and everything like that in the confinement cell at Lake Butler. But they actually had pulled our YOs. So when you're sentenced as a youth offender or when you get reclassified as a youth offender, if you do something extreme like assault on an inmate and... You know, your custody level rises up. What they do is they actually take away that youth defender title. So you'll get sent to an adult prison once your youth defender title is gone. That's what happened. So from Lake Butler, now actually, let me just tell you how about, you know, how Lake Butler's confinement is. Um, Lake Butler, they don't give you cups when you're in confinement. A lot of the times they weren't even giving us plastic sporks. Which means that if you don't have a cup in your property that you bought off a canteen, you're not drinking anything. You got to drink out of the sink that barely even works. The water will dribble out. So you'll have to put your mouth on the metal if you want any water. Or what you do is you create a funnel. Uh, if you take like a big pen, you know, the little flexible pens and you empty it out, that empty tube you would stick into the hole of the sink push it and the water would force out of the tube and that way you're not putting your mouth on anything nasty. But what they literally used to do because they didn't have cups is they would push a cart with this, you know, a big jug of juice or whatever it was, watered down juice. And they would take a cup that you have and dip it in there and give it to you. So you don't know if someone's cup is dirty, if someone's cup, they're all getting dunked into this thing and passed out. Me and my, my bunkie, we didn't have cups, so we were never given drinks. A few times we weren't given any sporks to eat with. We had to eat everything with our hands. You know, some of these meals that we get are supposed to be solids and they're not. They come like liquids. You know what I mean? Like pudding was water. We're, we're having to eat it with our hands because we have nothing to eat. And I mean, 
Lake Butler was the worst confinement I've ever been in. There was a guy in Lake Butler's confinement that he was, what's the word for it? Um, he couldn't be in small spaces. He used to freak out. I forget the word for it, but he just, it was like a, a thing that he couldn't be in a small space. And they ended up putting him in confinement. And you could tell being around him for, you know, a few seconds that he was just mentally unstable. He didn't, he shouldn't even have been in a prison. He should have been in a mental facility. More or less with this guy, the story behind it is he was kicking down his door crying trying to get out of confinement you know begging begging Lake Butler they have an orderly that walks around and you know he'll sweep up or whatever like that and like if I want to pass something to another cell usually the orderly will do it so he was begging the orderly for a razor you know begging him and begging him and the orderly he knows better he's like I'm not going to give you a razor push come to shove later in the night the orderly got you know put back in a cell or I'm not sure if at Lake Butler the orderlies are actually in confinement with you at some spots it's like that if they have a favorite they'll let someone out of their cell and clean up otherwise they'll just take someone from the compound but the orderly left for the night this guy's kicking on the doors begging for a razor begging for a razor a CO does his rounds the CO stopped at this man's cell and then walked away you know what I mean? And the guy in the cell went quiet. He didn't go in the cell. The door's locked. But the cell went quiet. Um, they do rounds every 30 minutes. Sometimes they skip it and they'll do it in an hour or something like that. The next time he did his round, he called in for backup. They popped his door. The guy had slit his throat. And, you know, they had to carry him out. And uh, the orderly came back. And the orderly had to clean up all the blood from inside of the cell. The orderly didn't give him the razor. You know what I mean? And what I would assume happened is the CO dropped a razor and then kicked it under the guy's door. And the guy cut his throat. He didn't live. He died in that cell. Lake Butler is, is a very, very demonic place. And the CO is there. If you look into the history of what's happened at Lake Butler before, you know what I mean? It's, it's nothing new. You know, everyone in the comments has been talking about a jar of gold teeth. I never saw a jar of gold teeth, but one of the biggest rumors about Lake Butler is that, you know, being that it's a majority white correction officers, they hate minorities. They hate anyone that has gold teeth in their mouth, which is usually minorities, especially in Florida. And they would knock out these teeth and keep them in a jar. And show the inmates to scare them. I've never seen it, but everybody knows about the rumor. Um, so I get transferred from Lake Butler to the Northwest Florida Reception Center, which is, I believe, Washington. Now, this is the first time I get an adult in my room. They put a guy in my room that looks like Kimbo Slice. Like a 40-year-old, you know, big black guy. He was doing, I think, 20 years um, it was an attempted murder charge on his wife, and this is something I really want y'all to understand. When you're in the room with someone that can physically overpower you, you are in no control, and that's one of the worst sickening feelings that you can have, is when you know that if you're in the room with someone that has bad intentions, you can do nothing about it. This guy was like 6'4", and was just giant. Just a giant, giant guy. I've already been in confinement for months, so I've lost a ton of weight. Everybody loses weight in confinement. You know how they say, like, oh, you'll be locked down for 23 hours a day, one hour of wreck. Sometimes we wouldn't get wrecked for weeks. Sometimes we wouldn't get showers for days. You know what I mean? They don't care. And they put this guy in my room. There's no way I can stop him, you know, from anything. I was blessed. This guy was like a born-again Christian. All he did was read his Bible. He was a Haitian guy and used to tell me about Haiti, growing up in Haiti and, you know, everything about it. He told me I reminded him of one of his son's friends. He, his son had a friend that was white. And um, he was a good bunkie, you know what I mean? We talked, we played chess, whatever. We had to draw out a chess game and rip pieces of paper for pieces. 
but he was a good bunky. It is not always like that. You have some guys that have been in confinement since the 80s on CM, which is closed management, where you're not allowed to be on a regular compound. You're locked down for basically forever until they decide to let you out. You have guys that will knock you out and rape you, and you can't do anything about it. You can talk as tough as you want. You can act big and bad. But when you get your face beat in, and you wake up and you're bleeding out of places that you shouldn't be, there's nothing you can do. And you know what's even worse is when you wake up and you realize that, you still can't do anything about it except tell a CO. What are you going to do? There's no weapon in there with you. And a lot of people think, you know, oh, if I had a knife, I'll do this, I'll do that. You have people that will tell you, I will take that knife from you and put it inside of you. Just because you have a knife doesn't mean that you know how to use it better than the next man who's actually used knives a lot longer than you. You know, you got guys that have been in there forever that love confinement. They love raping other people. It's, it's a dangerous situation depending on who you get put in that room with. Um, and it happens all the damn time. So we were in the room for a little bit and then I got transferred again. And I got transferred to Lancaster, uh, not, I'm sorry, not Lancaster. I got transferred to Appalachia CI, ACI. It's in the Panhandle. So literally there's a lake across from ACI's rec yard and it's Alabama on one side, Georgia on the other. This is the countryest place I've ever been to. When I get to ACI, I'm still in confinement. I still have to do time in confinement. Um... You know, I'm just, I don't know anyone here. I'm hoping that there's someone here from, you know, the youth defenders from Lancaster or something. So I know somebody. It's like I said, if you don't have a reputation, you need to build a reputation. Every new spot you go, you might have to keep repeating the things that you've done, which more or less I mean violence. So I get put in a, uh, Appalachia's confinement. I don't remember who my first, you know, bunkie was, but I never really got a bad bunkie. I was getting like, you know, dudes that had like 30 days in confinement, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But the first time I got taken out for showers, you know, everybody's on the door watching everyone that comes out because you want to see who's in there. And um, they saw a lot of the tattoos that I have on my arm. Let me see so I can show you all this. You know, they peep the tattoos and they start asking questions like, oh, are you a blood? Are you this? Are you that? We had an orderly in there who was the barber. Come to find out this kid was at Lancaster with me. So first quarter, you know, he starts telling the other bloods that are in the um, confinement dorm like, oh, yeah, I know him. Da -da -da, I'll vouch for him. All that. Right. So I end up getting moved into a different wing of confinement. Um, when I get moved into this different wing. I get a kite. Someone wrote a note and had a, uh, a orderly pass it up to me. Basically, it's a bunch of blood stuff that's written on this, you know, trying to talk in code and this and that. But a lot of the things that's being said don't make any sense. And this guy's saying that he has some ridiculous rank and all this craziness. So I, don't, I didn't even write back to the kite. You know what I mean? I'm not really trying to send kites and just waste my paper writing you. I don't even know you. I'll talk to you when I get out on the compound. I believe it was like two days later. Mind you, I'm in, I think it was 10 top. The guy that wrote me the kite is in 10 bottom. That's saying he's a blood. I think it was a few days later and I get another kite put in my room. So I get the kite and it says to Riri. My bunkie at the time knew who Riri was. ACI was a very you know, homosexual compound where you had a lot of people that were openly gay and you had a lot of people, you know, when I say gay, I don't just mean that they act feminine. You had a lot of them and then you had a lot of guys that were straight killers in gangs, faces completely tattooed that would take part in activities like that. Generally, the ones that act feminine, you know, they have nicknames and they're female nicknames. So this particular person was Riri, which was short for Rihanna. 
this person, his cell was, I think, too top. The kite was written by the blood under me. And it was, oh, no, no, no. The kite was writ written by, you know, the dude named Riri. But it was for 10 bottom, which is the blood that's under my cell. But instead, the orderly gave it to me at 10 top. So I read the whole kite. Automatically, I figure out the dude that's, you know, under my cell claiming to be a blood is taking part in homosexual activities, which is a no no. You know what I mean? So the orderly came uh, like a few days later that cut hair. I call him over to my cell, I give him the kite. And I'm like, yo, dude in the bottom or whatever, he's saying he's this, he's got this rank. That kid went downstairs and got on the door with this guy and put him on blast in front of the whole dorm. There weren't any COs in the dorm at this time, just the orderly. Put him on blast in front of the whole dorm and basically told him that when he gets out of confinement, you know, he's got to answer to what he's done. That guy went PC that night. It's a grown man, like late 30s, maybe early 40s. You know, grown man, just check protective custody off rip. I ended up getting moved into, I believe it was two bottom. And I didn't have a bunkie for like two weeks. I had a window that when I looked out, I could see the driveway, like the walkway where they bring the buses. When they bring people in. When I was in confinement at Appalachia, I must have saw like eight ambulances pull up into the... Um, ambulances are driving through all the way up to the wreck yard to go pick up somebody that just got gutted on the wreck yard. There were people getting hit up in the neck, um, getting air flighted out of there. I think it was maybe like six months or maybe even less than that. Right before I got to Appalachia, they had killed a guy in one of the dorms. And what happened is uh, they caught him in the shower. These two guys, they caught him in the shower. One guy held him down while the other guy took a knife and just, you know, kept stabbing him in the stomach. And then they switched off. They took turns. Then the other guy held him down and the other guy did it. Basically, all of his guts, you know, were all over the shower floor. And they went back to their bunk, acted like nothing happened. When the CO did count time, they found out someone was missing. They locked down the compound. They found him in the shower. Um, come to find out, he was a sex offender. That's not even the reason they killed him. The reason they killed him is because he owed, you know, probably like $20 in canteen. It was a gambling debt. But because he had a gambling debt, and I guess he was a sex offender, they just decided to just kill him. And um, they got charged for it, too. They didn't get away with it. But that happened pretty much right before I got there. While I'm there, all I'm hearing about is stories about people getting stabbed up, air flighted out, ambulances pulling up. This guy just died. There were multiple people that died while I was at Appalachia CI. There was a kid who got moved into the wing. A white kid from Tampa. Babyface kid. I think he was like 18, so one of the youngest on the compound. I was 19 when I got to Appalachia. And when he got moved in, they put him in the room with an older white guy, maybe 50-something years old. The very first night he got put into that room, we can hear them fighting. Everyone hears the fights. It's so quiet in confinement when no one talks, you can hear anything in another room. So when you hear the walls, you know, it's going down. We hear him fighting the old guy, you know what I mean? I didn't know the details of this case until I actually got out of prison and looked it up. I actually Googled it and saw what happened. The old guy, the 50-something-year-old, you know, exposed himself to the 18-year-old. And a lot of these people at Appalachia CI, specifically adults, like let's say 30-something and up, were predators, sexual predators. You know, if they couldn't rape you, they would try to finesse you. They would scare you into having sex. There was all different type of things going on. And, you know, at the youth defender camps, the JIT camps, extortion is just, we want your food. 
You know what I mean? We want your canteen. We want your biscuits in the morning. We want your coffee cakes, your brownie, chicken, whatever. We just want food, money. That's it. Adults, they want to rape you over and over and over again. And you got guys that have been in there since the you know 80s, 90s that have had AIDS for 20-something years. And they're all just passing it around. Everybody's getting sick. You know what I mean? So you would have kids that come in with, you know, a year and a day. He's not even gay, but he does what he does to survive in prison, ends up going home and, you know, has sex with a girl on the street. And now he's giving out AIDS because of someone that raped him in prison. It's dead serious. It's just like that. You know, you got guys that will come home and have sex with their child's mother. And now the child's mother has AIDS. Because of something that they caught inside of prison. Whether they were partaking willingly in those activities or someone raped them. And it happened all the damn time. So the white kid, he beat that old man to death. He didn't die immediately in the cell, but he got carried out. And the old man ended up dying. And that kid um, got transferred to the county jail. I looked that kid up. He's killed two people now since he's been in prison. He's only 20-something. Both the people that he's killed were older men. He killed the other one, actually, I believe, in the county jail that he went to while he was fighting the other murder charge. He has a life sentence now. I think he went to prison originally with 24 months, which is two years. And he killed two people that were trying to rape him in confinement. He's locked in a cell with them. They exposed themselves. He fought, he defended himself, they died, and now he's never getting out. Y'all think confinement's sweet, y'all think prison's sweet, you know what I mean? A lot of people would be like, oh, I can survive this, I can survive that. Confinement is a whole nother level, it's a whole nother playing field. There's no weapon, there's none of that. You can't avoid situations like these. You know what I mean? You can't. I was blessed to never actually have to deal with someone like that. Um, where it was taken to that point. Now, I had a guy get moved into my room that was 40-something. Tattoos all over his face, neck, hands, everything. Everything on him was tattooed. We were in there for about a day before he told me that he used to get down, which means he used to partake in those activities. Me being white, I already have that against me in prison. Me being a gang member, I already have that against me in prison. Um, because it's not common. Not the gang that I'm in. But to be in a room with someone like that, I, I wouldn't allow it. Reason being, all it takes is one rumor to start. Oh, him? He's in a gang? Oh, yeah, he was in the cell with da-da-da, and everyone knows da-da-da gets down. So they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, big black dude, little white boy, he was probably whatever, whatever. One of the deadliest rumors that can ever start about you because it's mandatory that if something like that happens, you need to put a knife into somebody. Period. Period. There's no going around it. You can't go check them and fight them. You can't fight them because if you fight them, there's a chance of you catching something once their blood comes in contact with yours. If you're punching them in the mouth and your hand gets cut on their teeth, whatever's getting transferred is getting transferred. So that's something that made Appalachia so dangerous. You know the majority of these people are sick. On the main compound, there used to be a line a mile long in the mornings for people that had to take medication for AIDS. Full blown, you know what I mean? So when you get into it with someone like that that has a disease like that, you're not going to fight. You have to kill them. You have to get a knife and they have a knife and do whatever it does. And he told me that he used to partake in those activities and I immediately told him we can't be in a room together. I tried to tell him as respectfully as I could, we could not be in the room together because I cannot have... You know, any chance of someone starting a rumor about me. Because what I will have to do will keep me from going home. 
So whatever we need to do, we need to do it right now because I can't be in a room with you. Mind you, this is like the second day we're in the room together. The first day, you know, you introduce each other, you start talking. I got mail that night from my grandmother. My, my grandmother always sent me mail. Very, very spiritual person. And he was somewhat into that spirituality and things of that nature. Um, so we spoke on it. I showed him some of the older, you know, things she sent me on spirituality, this and that. And I came to him respectfully. Remember how I told you in the other video, if you come to somebody correctly, the outcome of what happens can be completely different. You know, so I didn't call him anything derogatory. I didn't say nothing extreme like I'm going to kill you if you don't get out of the room. I came to him with respect. And I was hoping it worked because if not, it would have had to go another way. He told me I respect you. And I respect what you said, and I respect your honesty. What he ended up doing is, you know, the CEOs bring mail at night. He already had a picture of his son that died in his property in the cell with us. You know, he had a, multiple pictures of the funeral. His kid got killed. Um, so he has a picture of him laying in a casket. He waited until the gods came around uh, and gave out mail. They go back in the booth another 30 minutes or whatever. They come to, you know, do their rounds again. And that's when he knocked on the door and the CEOs came and he, he pretty much put on a show. You know, he acted like something was wrong with them. The CEOs are asking him what's wrong, what's going on. And he puts the picture up of his dead son. He says, I just got this in the mail. I need to be in a room by myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need to be in a room by myself. I, I can't be in a room with anyone right now. When you're in a room with someone that just had a family member die, you don't know what is on their mind. You don't know what they want to do. You don't know if they if that's the last person they have in their family. You don't know how they're going to react. When Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida, there was an inmate who had a white inmate in his room. He was black. The other kid was white. This guy was, you know, in there for killing somebody. The white kid was in there for, I don't know, like Grand Theft Auto or something, a burglary. Nothing major. You only had a couple of years. That white kid begged the COs to get taken out of the room. The COs denied it. They basically told him to F off, deal with it. You know, a lot of these COs, if you try to go protective custody, they won't even let you. They'll look at you and be like, ain't nothing wrong with you. You're not bleeding. You're not scared for your life. That guy beat that kid to death. He beat him. He knocked him out and was jumping off the top bunk onto his head until his head crushed in. Confinement is dead serious. It's nothing to be taken lightly. That kid died in a confinement cell. His face was crushed. His skull crushed in. All because the COs didn't want to do their job. So the CEOs took it serious when he showed them the pictures of his dead son. And they took him out of the room and, you know, he cuffed up and he told me before he left. He's like, I respect you, bro. I respect everything you said. And I, you know, I told him vice versa. The same thing. You know what I mean? Just because someone takes, you know, partakes in things that I don't partake in doesn't mean you won't show respect to that person. I don't need to disrespect you just because our lifestyles are different what we do is different you know what i mean that's something i learned inside of prison the next cellmate i got was the first racist person truly racist i ever met and he was black he got put into my room we were about the same height but this guy looked he was built like a ufc fighter huge and he was from Broward County. The very first thing he said to me is, I'm racist. I don't like white people. But I'm going to respect you as a man. I didn't know what to say back to that. I was like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? I didn't know what to say. I was just, you know, never heard anyone just openly say something like that. He had already been down 10 years. Um... And this whole time period of being in the cell with this guy was a whole learning experience in itself. I had to learn how to deal with a racist. So at first, we didn't talk. We didn't communicate. 
um, guys that have been down a lot, you know, they come in, they clean the whole cell and everything, just that's something that institutionalized people do. I mean, generally you want to clean your cell, but they just do it anyways, even if it's already clean, just to make sure. We never really communicated. It was to the point that if, you know, if, if my bunk was the bottom bunk, so I sit on my bunk when I eat, he sits on the toilet. So when they pass food through the flap, you know, generally you would take the first tray and pass it to the guy next to you. I tried to pass it to me. He told me, I don't want to eat nothing you touched. So I'm like, oh, he's a real racist. He said, you know, it ain't no disrespect, but I'll grab my own shit. You know, he was like, it ain't no disrespect, but I'll grab my own stuff. And I was just like, you know, all right, if that's how you're rocking, that's how you're rocking. You know what I mean? We were, it was a very uncomfortable vibe in the room. We didn't get along. We didn't speak. You know, we, we just weren't, it was very awkward and it felt like something could pop off at any moment. Now, we got mail one night. What ended up happening is he was on the top bunk reading his mail and I was on the bottom bunk reading mine. And I think, you know, my mom was telling me how my little brother got my drawing that I sent him and put it up on the wall in his room. And all of a sudden, you know, my cellmate jumps off the bunk and starts screaming. He's screaming, no. He's slamming the cell door, hitting it with his whole arm, just slamming it. He dropped down to the floor, you know, just dropped down and was hitting the concrete floor, screaming, no, 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 my baby. The first thing I assumed was his kid died. You know what I mean? But I didn't know if he had kids. We didn't speak. I didn't know him. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, how is this going to turn out? Is he going to take this aggression and turn it towards me? And he's crying and screaming. And um, eventually he got quiet. And he sat on the toilet. And he, he just started talking. He opened up and started. He just he got right into the story. And he said, the woman that I loved on the street, I missed my opportunity to be with her and I chose to be in the streets instead. I loved her and she loved me, but my main focus wasn't on being in love at that age. So what he did is, you know, he was doing whatever he did to land himself in prison and you know what I mean? He's been down 10 years. So, he, he he has a release date. Like, I don't know if he got out already, if he's still in there and he's about to get out, but he had a release date. Basically, what happened is the woman that he loved, I guess at some point in time, she got AIDS. And she gave it to another guy. What happened is the guy went to her house broke inside of the house, shot her, and then shot himself. They both died. The 12-year-old daughter is the one that, you know, discovered the bodies. And the 7-year-old son was there too. And they both saw their mother laying there, you know, bleeding out, shot in the head. And... He told me how the son was, you know, she would tell him, because I think the son was only seven, so he never met the son. He was already doing so much time. But he told me how the, she would tell him the son was very sensitive and wasn't very outspoken. He was very quiet. And, you know, it made him cry even more thinking about the damage it's going to do, looking at his mother dead in front of him. From that point on, we started talking a little bit more, bits and pieces. And we used to get into race and history conversations. And, you know, he told me, he said, everyone's racist. You can't prove to me that everybody isn't racist. And he asked me a question. He said, if you were in a fire and there was a white baby and a black baby, which one would you save? If you could only save one, which one would you save? So I said, which one would you save? 
And you know, he said I would save my own to preserve my race. But my comment back to him was, my race is already preserved through me. If I have a child, that child will have white blood. But if I let that other child die, the race would be non-existent. You know what I mean? It was a tough question. It's a tough topic to think of. Something as serious as that. But he was just so, you know, that was just his whole upbringing was the white police and racism. and. But what I respected the most about him was how upfront he was. You know, there were white racists that had swastikas and this and that, but nobody would say the N-word in front of anyone else. Nobody would tell you they're openly racist. A lot of people would just say, you know, I'm proud to be white or this and that. But me being white, you know, if I was around a whole bunch of white guys, then I would hear something racist. But if there was any other race around, they wouldn't say anything, and that seemed very fake to me. That's something I respected about this man is the first thing he told me was his beliefs. But he'll respect me anyway as a man. He respected the fact that I knew a lot of history on a lot of different things. You know, the organization that I'm in, the roots and how everything came about. He respected the fact that I wasn't just some stupid kid claiming to be something and knew nothing about it. It's probably the only, you know, points that I got with him was the fact that I knew history. I've always liked history. And I I, I never picked one thing to learn about. You know what I mean? I was learning about the Moors in Africa. I was learning about the Panthers. I was trying to learn about things that weren't really taught in school because a lot of those things weren't taught in school. I learned about religion. You know, I learned a lot of things about Christianity that made me believe in a lot of different things and look at things in a lot of different ways, especially when it comes to race. He ended up um, finishing up his time in confinement. And, you know, before we left, he was like, yo, you got to tighten me up one time. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, we're we going to slap box. And we slap boxed in the cell. And that was the first time, like, we both, I don't know if he was smiling, because he was just, that's just how he was. He was a very, like, angry looking person. But it was the first time it was like a big brother, little brother vibe. And when he left confinement, he actually had an orderly. He went and bought canteen and had an orderly bring it into confinement. He snuck it in and gave it to me. I mean, he sent me a bar of soap. He sent me some stamps. He sent me um, a little bit of food. And something like that is major. When someone goes out of the way to send you something like that, it doesn't even matter, you know, what type of terms you guys are on. But for him to be how he was as a racist, as the way he carried himself, it spoke volumes to me. And I've never been able to get in contact with him since I got out. I've looked him up, but I actually don't remember his actual name. I only remember his nickname. But I've always wanted to write him just to tell him how it felt to be around him. Be presented with a situation I've never been presented with. You know, the racism that I dealt with in Florida was always towards me. It wasn't whites targeting blacks. It was blacks targeting whites. It was completely opposite. But at the same time, I got to witness how the COs targeted blacks. The racist things that they would say. You know, they keep a lot of the same terms that you'll hear in slave movies. Like boy. And, you know, having to call them sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They still say the same things. The COs act like slave masters. And being in the room with him, I got to understand his perspective on why he feels the way he feels. And I don't feel that he shouldn't feel that way. I just hope that when he comes home, he's somewhat able to put that behind him. And, you know, doesn't have to live that way. 
But he was one of the most solid guys that I met in prison, and he was brutally honest, and you can do nothing but respect that. Come to find out, um, one of my brothers that ended up getting shipped to Appalachia, who took over as the head blood at Appalachia, knew him, and they're from the same area, they're from Broward County. So later on in the story, when I got out of confinement, I met up with Tank again on the rec yard. And, you know, Tank never fully believed if I was what I said I was until I was introduced again to him by this person. We never considered each other friends or nothing like that, but I could tell it was a mutual respect at that point. And it felt good almost, you know what I mean? Because the whole time I was in confinement with him, I was trying to find a way to break that barrier of race because it wasn't something that I grew up with. I always grew up around multiple different races. I never had that issue. I was never called a cracker until I moved down to Florida. And you know, at first it was like a derogatory thing. And then it became like when we said cracker, it was just being referring to the police. And it just became a word that you didn't really, it didn't really bother you, you know what I mean? I know some kids that are white and are more in tune with the black culture and their nickname will be Cracker Black. And that's their nickname, you know what I mean? Or I know some Spanish kids in Florida that'll be more on the black culture and their name will be Chico Black. I learned a lot from being in that cell with that guy. And I hope that you guys are able to learn something from this story as well. But witnessing the amount of violence that was in that confinement dorm. I think about how easily my life could have been taken had he not been that person. You know, had he woke up one day and decided, I don't care. Or had I had another person put into the cell with me, how I could have never went home. These, these are the things that I want to bring to light. How do you put someone with a life sentence in the room with someone that has less than five years? It doesn't make sense to me. You have guys that have been on death row, set to be executed, that get pardoned. And then resentenced to life or multiple life sentences. And you're putting these guys in rooms with people that they're bigger than, with people that don't have a lot of time. You know, a lot of people that don't have a lot of time, they don't want to do violent things to risk the chance of increasing their time. And that's usually why they submit and do whatever that person tells them to do. It's a, it's a crazy situation. I hope that, you know, someone in a position of power is able to see this and make a change. But, like I said, I did over a year in confinement. Some of those nights were hard. Sometimes I didn't have a roommate in my room. Sometimes I hated my roommate. Sometimes I fought them multiple times. You know, I was gassed in confinement. I was gassed at Lancaster in confinement. And it took the skin off of my side. From my hip to, you know, up to my armpit. It was just raw pink. Um, I was sprayed with, you know, it's, it's nicknamed Black Jesus. But it was a huge can of gas. And when it sprayed me, it burnt my skin off. You know what I mean? They used to do what they call drive-bys in confinement. Where they'll pop everybody's flap that they serve food through. And the CO will walk through with a can of gas and spray into every single room. And have everybody choking. You had guys that had asthma that weren't supposed to be sprayed. That would let the COs know, I have asthma. Please don't spray me. They'd spray them and they would die. Because they stopped breathing. You had multiple suicides in confinement. You know... Um, the toilets in prison are super, super strong. You can flush sheets down the toilets. And one thing that has happened multiple times in prison 
is they would take one end of the sheet and tie it around their throat. They'd take the other sheet, put it in the toilet, and sit down in front of the toilet and flush it so that the pressure from the toilet pulls on their throat and they suffocate themselves because there's not really anything to hang yourself from. You had people that would slit their throats, slit their wrists in confinement. You had COs that would starve you in confinement to the point that you're physically sick. I was food poisoned in confinement. Non-stop throwing up and diarrhea. I was refused medical the entire day until the night shift came. Even my cellmate was kicking down the door telling the COs he can't stop throwing up. He can't stop throwing up. And at that point I'm just gagging. There's nothing coming out of me. They didn't care. They refused me medical treatment. They wouldn't help me. They wouldn't even open the door. They want to let you die. So for for those that you believe you can survive on a prison compound, you're tough, you can fight, you got weapons, that's only one element of prison. You know, a lot of people don't even think about confinement until you're in there. And a lot of people tell me like, oh, I could never do confinement. I could never be in a small room like that for that long. You could do it just like I did it. And the reason I say that is because you don't have an option. You can't get out. And you have to learn to mentally get over that. You can't get out of this room. I was in one cell where I could touch both walls at the same time. Just reaching out my arms. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy place to be. And it's sickening when you can hear people getting stomped out getting beat down inside of the cells you know there were people that would have strokes and everyone would get on the door kicking 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 eventually the co comes in why is everybody kicking oh he's having a stroke he's having a stroke oh well let me know when he dies and they walk back out and the guy will be in there and his his bunkie will be trying to give him cpr and he ends up dying and when he dies you know what happens the Florida Department of Corrections tells that person's relatives that he died from natural causes. Or you'll have people that were killed on the compound and they'll tell the relatives they don't know what happened. It's still under investigation. Year after year after year, it's under investigation. Like I say with all videos, I hope that there's something that you guys are able to learn from this. Um, it's insane to, you know, it's, it's, it still bothers me even just talking about it. There's something that needs to be heard though. It's something that I have to put out there, that I have to let it be known. And if you guys want to look up some of the things I'm speaking about, look up Appalachie Correctional Institution in, what is it? Oh, I forget exactly where it's at. It's in Jackson County. But look up Appalachian Correctional Institution. Google it. Put abuse next to it. Put deaths next to it. You'll see everything I'm talking about. And this is going on on every single compound. These same type of things. There's no racial segregation. There's no gang segregation. There's no time segregation. There's no size segregation. They'll put you in there with a killer and leave you in there to die. But hey, until next time, this is EOS, 1090 Jake. Appreciate all the subscribers. See y'all soon.